Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Alumni Entrepreneur Q&A uh, today featuring Philip Andrews. The University of Southern Queensland always likes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet today. Further, we acknowledge the cultural diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and pay respect to their elders past, present and future. My name is Phoebe Tully and I am the Senior Project Coordinator of Entrepreneurship at USQ. And today I am speaking to Philip Andrews of Liquid State, which and he will tell you is an international communications company that specializes in healthcare and enterprise environments. Thank you so much for joining us today, Philip. It's my pleasure entirely. Can we start by you telling me why you decided to study at USQ and what you studied? So um, interesting story at the time, uh, I was actually a practicing photographer and uh, I saw um, the world changing uh, towards digital. And I wanted to improve uh, or get a base understanding of uh, some digital imaging skills. Um, <clears throat> as it was early on in that kind of change from traditional technologies to digital technologies, there wasn't actually uh, any formal courses around. Uh, and so I was looking for a technology course that I thought might be of use at some stage in the future and give me some foundational understanding about uh, digital, all things digital, I guess. And so that led me to do, to do the course at USQ. Um, it didn't have any digital imaging in it whatsoever. Uh, however, the, the skills and the understanding that I picked up there, uh, interestingly enough, I use on a daily basis now in my current work. Mm. And that was a graduate certificate of IT, wasn't it? That's it, yes. Yeah. Systems yeah. analysis and design, which yeah. uh, is, can be considered quite a dry subject, but uh, but uh, definitely something that impacts on most businesses worldwide, whether you realize it or not. So mm -hmm. the way in which um, systems work, the way in which business interacts with systems, the way in our current work, how communications can be seen as a system um, and how important it is to understand how those systems, uh, I guess, uh, interplay with other parts of our lives uh, is, is probably more fundamental than most people believe. Mm, mm. Let's go right back to the beginning of your career. Um, as you say, you started in photography um, and as an award-winning photographer at that. Can you tell me a bit about that stretch of your career, how you, know, how you started and then how you sort of transitioned out of it? Right. So um, I, when I left school, I, I had a choice between architecture and, uh, and art college. Um, I chose architecture because my, I guess, those around me thought it would be a better career choice. Um, I lasted a year and then went to art college uh, because you got better haircuts uh, at art college. Uh, but it was far more interesting for me. And uh, I studied photography and graphic design there. And I had the, I had the privilege of, of spending a few years working as a documentary photographer. Um, in those days, it wasn't particularly easy to make any money from documentary photography. So I also ran my own uh, uh, photography studio doing uh, documenting artworks and things like that uh, in, a, in a company called Folio Arts. And, uh, but at the time I was doing a lot of documentary photography, most of it pro bono work. And the, um, the award that you're talking about is that was the Leica Documentary Award, which um, I have to say was more to do with my subject than to do with my skills. So I, I was very lucky to photograph uh, a survivor of Auschwitz and mm -hmm. uh, Leon's story was particularly powerful, particularly moving. And I just happened to be a witness uh, to that. And so the images, the power in those images uh, and the way that they portrayed his story and his journey uh, was really as more about him than about me. Uh, so, and that's, that's continues to be a passion in my life, uh, taking images and making images and, and telling stories, but just not part of my work life. Mm. You then moved into uh, publishing and media. Can you tell me a bit about how you made that pivot and um, I guess how that came about? So um, continuing my kind of journey into the changing technologies in photography, uh, we went to the UK and uh, I studied uh, and worked alongside uh, one of the first authors of digital photography books uh, in the world. And uh, he, he was publishing for a company called Focal Press. And Focal Press um, was a well-regarded and well-known company uh, out of Oxford. 
and all of the the books that you would study when you did your courses at, at our college uh, in photography were coming out of Focal Press, all the well-regarded ones. Okay. So um, it was a particularly privilege, uh, a particular privilege of mine to study with with Adrian under Adrian and to work alongside him in the in the college there. So I was teaching there, um, and he was teaching there, and at that during that year or so, I kind of got an understanding about how uh, in the UK at that time, uh, publishing, uh, photographers publishing, educators publishing, those people who understood things publishing had maybe some greater opportunities to do that than perhaps we had in Australia. And so under his tutelage, I managed to, to pick up some articles in some uh, magazines over there, uh, which I, I photographed and wrote. Uh, the articles as well and then that proceeded into more work which um, revolved around commissioned books and then we eventually uh, started our own publishing company and so there was that was a particularly fantastic period of, of my life uh, where we published over 50 or 60 titles um, and they were uh, in conjunction with the major publishing houses around the world and that was amazing time uh, for publishers and for myself. Had a small team, diverse team around the world who helped us do that. We also published a national magazine here and in New Zealand, uh, a couple of those, Better Photoshop Techniques uh, was one of the titles that we worked with. And, uh, and that got us into working with Adobe in the States. And so Adobe is, um, uh, obviously the publishers of Photoshop and InDesign and Illustrator. And so I ended up becoming uh, an ambassador for a, a Adobe, which essentially means you, you get to take photographs, use their software tools, and then wander around the world talking about how great it is to do that. So I'm at the envy of everybody else. <laughs> yeah, not a bad gig at all. No, pretty good. So. <laughs> Uh, and that led into doing writing for Adobe. So for a couple of years there, I think about four or five years, um, I was the only non-US based uh, author for Adobe writing for Photoshop uh, releases. Oh, so wow. um, that stuff was really good. Um, but publishing has changed and changed forever. Mm -hmm. And almost overnight, uh, book publishing, magazine publishing became very, very challenging in terms of trying to make a dollar and probably still is as you as you know, from closures of magazines, newspapers around the world and book publishers struggling. Uh, so it required us to really do some hard thinking about um, how to take some of the things that we'd learnt and bring them to the new age, which at th that time, Steve Jobs was talking about how iPads were gonna save publishing. Uh, so that got me into this crazy period of life where um, we had, at the time, I. I think we had copyright over six or seven million words in the in the area, and so we were thinking, how can we reuse this this kind of um, treasure trove of information, but uh, bring it to phones and tablets? Mm -hmm. And so we started to do some exploratory work there, um, and that led me to a partnership with my current partner in Liquid State. Uh, so together we built the first um, mechanism to take printed content through to the iPad very quickly. And, uh, and that was the first kind of product for Liquid State. Mm. Tell me more about Liquid State. That was about 10 years ago that you started that company. Uh, what did it start off doing? Can you elaborate on that? But also, can you kind of paint the picture of how that's changed over 10 years and, and what you're up to now? Sure. So first of all, the name Liquid State. So um, a lot of people believe it's uh, something to do with what we do on Friday afternoons. Uh, but... <laughs> Uh, which for a technology company probably has more truth than it should. Um, but really it's about content. So uh, for us, it was always about keeping your content in a very fluid form hmm. that could be delivered into a range of different devices, a range of different, through a range of different channels. And in particular, uh, in response to the interests and the desires of the reader. So we started... Um, taking the publishing experience that I had and also the, uh, the big web experience that my co-partner Cyril Dusson has um, and trying to put together a way in which we could um, capture content in a very fluid form 
and deliver it to people uh, across their many devices. That seems like a, a no brainer nowadays, but uh, 10 years ago, we were still struggling with trying to have content in a form that would work on small screens, medium screens, large screens, and in print, uh, on web, on devices. Um, and so there was kind of some technological challenges that we had to mm. encounter there. At the time, we, we didn't realize it, but we, we ended up building a competitive product to Adobe, which was kind of fun uh, because I still knew, all, I still had a lot of friends and knew a lot of people in Adobe. And we were you know, issuing press releases that we could do this better than Adobe could. And of course they're huge and we were tiny. <laughs> and, and my friends would ring me up and have a bit of a joke about it at the same time issuing press releases saying they're gonna sue us and all these sorts of things. So it was kind of, fun, it was a kind of a fun time, uh, but uh, in the end it became uh, a little difficult to maintain because publishing in itself is still quite a broken business model. We haven't really managed to make a huge transition in terms of the way in which we do business uh, in the publishing world from something that was fundamentally supported by lots of classifiers, lots of advertising, um, and we haven't managed to change people's opinions about gaining access to content uh, that previously was free or supported by advertising, which is actually how it worked. Um, and these days with the dissemination of information, so many more channels, so many more ways to engage, so many more publishers, everybody who tweets something is, is basically a publisher. Mm -hmm. um, it's changed the way in which publishing fundamentally uh, works. And so we tried very much to make that whole thing work and it, uh, it was very difficult to make any money out of it. We had hundreds of people using our solution around the world in multiple languages and we still couldn't turn a buck. So um, in, a, in a kind of business sense, uh, there was no legs in it for us. Uh, so almost overnight, we had to really look at the way in which um, we will, the way in which we had constructed technologies to help deliver content in a very personalized and segmented way based on people's um, own circumstances and think about how that might be better used somewhere else outside of the publishing area. And that brought us to uh, enterprise level communications and eventually into healthcare. Mm -hmm. So in healthcare, matching specific information to people's own health journeys is one of the core things that we can do to try and make people's own health journeys better. And the sheer size and weight and fragmentation of the whole healthcare environment for most people means that uh, the communication that surrounds their journeys is very fragmented, segmented, um, sometimes conflictual, um, and certainly doesn't travel with them through the length of their journey. So we found a quite, um, I think we found a place where the technologies that we had built um, resonated particularly well. So mm -hmm. now what we have is the ability to take uh, a person's whole uh, journey from diagnosis through to recovery and to to align um, smart communication, smart information, smart uh, details, smart help and support and education uh, with each stage of that journey. Mm -hmm. And initially we were doing that for large companies like Sonic Healthcare, Bebron uh, in Germany and Europe. And now we provide that um, in a kind of self-managed environment uh, mm -hmm. for others to do it themselves. How do you find that niche? You know healthcare to me hearing your story doesn't seem like an obvious uh, space for you to be playing in. How did you find that healthcare was a place where you wanted to specialize? So as, as, a, as a business person and, and someone interested in IT, um, one, of the, one of the things that can be a death to a business is being blinkered about the way in which your technology should be applied or mm -hmm. where it's best used. Mm -hmm. um, thankful, thankfully, we had some quite um, uh, strong reasons to, to, to look sideways about where our technology could be used. And that, that's probably <laughs> bankruptcy staring in your face because you couldn't make any money about where you thought it should be used. Um, so when you see that where you anticipate your technology can be used is not, um, not providing you with the, the income or the, the kind of growth that you need, you then need to think about 
should you just jump out of that business or should you are there other places that you mm -hmm. haven't even conceived of um, that maybe could be using this business and it's not like we we uh we didn't try a range of other verticals we tried a range of other verticals where we we looked for um areas that would value personalized information being delivered mm -hmm. and so there's still a range of verticals i mean things like um workplace health and safety you, mm -hmm. you have a you have a work environment that work environment has a set of circumstances set of requirements a set of communications that should be delivered to you and that you may need to respond to in terms of forms or surveys or mm -hmm. or providing tickets or whatever and that could be on a you know work site or a mine site or a or a hospital kind of situation have mm -hmm. you been vaccinated perhaps um you know, these kind of things, all of that is just about communications and about two-way communications, personalized communications and technology and how that works with it. So we can see that our technology can work in a range of different areas. Um, and it just so happens that healthcare, um, Sonic, Sonic Healthcare, for instance, uh, a, a fantastic Australian company, um, was one of the first enterprise companies that saw the value of what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And um, we're a longstanding customer of theirs and a strategic partner uh, with some of their communication products and it uh, their belief in what we were doing uh, really helped us to examine is healthcare a space that we should really be in and uh, and thankfully we found that it was hmm. and i know you have another healthcare product or or perhaps it's this, this one we're talking about called pep health that was kind of the the COVID project can you tell me a bit about that sure so um, we're a, we're a small company, but but uh, we we've always been world focused. So um, coming into COVID, seventy five percent, a little bit more, seventy five percent of our income came from uh, export exporting our technologies, mm -hmm. in particular into Europe and the UK. Uh, we had an office in Berlin uh, where we were working, um, and Germany was our bigger biggest customer base. Um, along comes COVID. And uh, a lot of those uh, larger enterprise deals that you would normally do, um, you generally need to be in the room sitting across from people looking at them eye to eye for them to sign big checks. So we managed to support our, the customers that we currently had, do extension projects with those customers, uh, but we weren't able, as able to, to um, attract uh, new customers, new logos, new big projects uh, without the ability to travel and to more, work more freely in, in the European space. So it really gave us the opportunity to, and the space and resourcing to sit back a little bit and go, okay, we've been doing this for almost a decade now. What's, what's in common with all of these large enterprise projects that typically are tens, hundreds, thousands of dollars and take um, you know, a year or more to deliver? What's in common across all of those projects? And uh, what we distilled from that was a set of features and functions um, that we think could be applied across the whole of the health sector. So mm -hmm. one of the problems that I think uh, inadvertently we, we were helping to perpetrate in the health sector was um, continuing to provide silos areas of information. Uh -huh. So we would do this great project for this particular hospital with this particular uh, surgery, but it only would provide communications to the patient whilst they're in the hospital. Well, we do this piece mm -hmm. over here that would provide support for someone when they were leading up to some type of treatment, but nothing in terms of recovery or discharge. So um, we thought, okay, if we take those learnings and we actually look at the bigger problem, if we are able to provide a single communication platform that can run from um, uh, a person in their home uh, or in the community or at the local clinic with their GP in a specialist clinic, in a hospital, in a waiting room at a hospital, in the discharge ward, in recovery and back home again and have their communications around the patient as they flow through that, uh, through their own health journey rather than the, the hospital or the organisation and the, and the patient kind of circa, cir circling around them, they need to be at the centre of that. Um, then, then I think we can actually try and help solve some of those siloed issues and try at the same time to empower the patient and provide them with a much more supported end-to-end -end journey. So PEP.health is, um, is, our, is our attempt to try and put those ideas into action. We've got um, uh, five uh, big pilots running at the moment uh, in, in that space, and we're learning a lot from our pilot customers. Queensland mm -hmm. Health is one of them um, about what works, what doesn't work, what they like, what they hate. And uh, and you'll see a public release of that uh, product next year, so. 
that's hugely exciting. Yeah, it's great fun. Um, and it's, I think our guys get a, uh, an extra kind of spring in their step when they're working A, in health, but B, in something that they can recite five, six people in their immediate family or friendship group who could, could um, uh, benefit from having better communication. Um, mm -hmm. And if you look at the stats around it, it's insane. You know, 25% of all readmissions um, could, have, could have been avoided if there was just better communication. One in three wow. sentinel events, which are, is death or, um, or permanent disability, could have been avoided with better communication. $1.7 billion in, in, in the States last year and just in um, uh, litigation could have been avoided, medical litigation could have been avoided if there was better communication with the patient. I mean, all of these sorts of things just point towards trying to do things better, but, but communication never seems to be something that's on the agenda in the health space. It's mm. machines that go bing or, you know, something you put on your face to protect you from virus or, you know, building a new building. But, um, but there is, I think it's because communication is probably more difficult to do um, and more difficult to measure. Uh, but if you've been on the receiving end of poor communication in healthcare, then you can know how it, it impacts on you. Mm, that's really interesting. Um, innovation looks different in so many ways. You know, it's not just technology in terms of a, a gadget that I can see. No, definitely. I mean, I was only speaking with one of our customers today and I was saying to them, look, we have this amazing technical suite, but a technical suite is nothing if you don't have a good communications plan. Yeah. So we're only as good as the communications plans that our customers put together. And so I was trying to encourage them to, to not rely on the technology as um, something that's going to help in their case with uh, medication adherence. Uh -huh. um, around patients. It has to be about engaging communication on, in the very first instance, and then the technology delivers that engaging communication. Yeah. So I was encouraging them to, to look at the research around um, the psychology of why people don't keep up with their, medic with their medication, or conversely, the sorts of um, encouraging activities that can be undertaken in order mm -hmm. to help them keep up with their medication, mm. and then to use that as the basis for the comms plan, and then to use our technology as the mechanism to deliver that. Mm, very interesting. I want to switch gears a little bit here. Sure. And it's unfortunate, but true that uh, some of our greatest learnings come from our mistakes. <laughs> Do you have, you know, a greatest favorite mistake that you would be willing to share with us? Um, I want to preface it by saying one of the reasons why we like working with Europeans is that they're probably more able to talk about their mistakes and their mm -hmm. failings and are more prepared to do that and are more understanding of other people's mistakes and failings. Um, especially if they've been used to, to improve things. Mm -hmm. uh, in Australia, we tend to not talk about those things. Mm. We tend to see any kind of mistake as a failure and therefore we tend to hide those things. So I'm, I'm happy to tell you that, you know, we probably ran after publishing as a, as a, as a space um, two years too long. Mm -hmm. And um, it brought us to the brink of, of collapse uh, financially and, um, you know, as a company. Because, you know, that was my background, I understood it very well, I knew what the problems were, I knew what the solutions were, as I thought, thought they should be. Um, but they're just, it was the wrong time. And um, I think we were probably, when I say we, it was probably me, was probably too stubborn about thinking, and maybe too stubborn about thinking that we had the solution to help solve what the issues were in the industry and maybe fearful about um, thinking that we might have to go somewhere else where perhaps I didn't have such as, as, as high a degree of embedded knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, took, it took the kind of looming cliff <laughs> and me feeling like a lemon, kind of running towards a looming cliff um, to, to actually think, okay, we've got to do something here. It's got to be desperate and it's got to be, it's got to be a decision based on you know, blinkers off, where are we? What's our core value? Where's our, what's the core value of the technology that we've developed and where else can that be sitting? Um, and to be honest, the, the creativity that, that I learned at our college 
um, and problem solving that I learned at art college, I apply in my business life all the time, which is, you know, don't just try and think in the way that you've always thought, but try and think outside of that and think, think of the problem from this side and that side and the other side. And so it was only when we stood back from our assumptions that we really started to understand, well, there's core value here that could be used elsewhere. And mm -hmm. perhaps other people will value it more, even yeah. though it was born out of publishing. Um, we found that personalized communication is way more valuable to enterprise and to healthcare um, at this point than it, than, than it was in publishing, so. Mm, that's, really, that's really interesting. What is the best investment that you've made in your company? Maybe, maybe thinking about liquid state, uh, the best investment that you've made in that. The best investment is always people mm -hmm. um, because um, it's both the positive and the negative. If you, if you get the wrong people, it can be very detrimental to your business. If you get the right people with the right attitude, um, even if they don't have necessarily the right skills at the time that you hire them, uh, then they will definitely make a big difference in your business. Um, lots, you know, technologies and, um, and more physical things come and go, uh, but surrounding yourself with loyal people of like mind who are heading in the same direction and are committed to trying to produce um, good customer relationships um, to be honest and open and transparent in the way that they deal with people and with outside and inside and are committed to trying to create great products in our case. Um, there's, there's nothing that's uh, more valuable than investing in those. Um, and I wish, you know, I wish I could invest more. And through COVID was a great chance for us to, to put that into action. We had uh, some staff who weren't able to get a uh, job keeper um, and, and yet the company supported them all the way through with no changes in their work conditions. Um, we had, if you, if, you looked at, if you looked at the circumstances in just in terms of numbers, you probably would have changed the, the fundamentals of the company drastically. But, but when you've built up a good uh, group of people and, uh, and they've invested themselves uh, in each other and in your company and in the technology, then you kind of owe it to, to have the company try and see them through those difficult times. And we're coming out the other side now and things are picking up, which is great. Um, but it's particularly difficult when you, there's a restriction in, in travel. Um, if, if your main customers are in healthcare and all of their focus is on, oh my God, mm -hmm. do we have enough beds and ventilators? Mm -hmm. Then improving communications to your outpatients <laughs> kind of drops down the list of importance mm -hmm. um, and rightly so. So, you know, a lot of our projects were slowed or stopped or paused or, or put off for a year or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so for us, uh, it was a matter of um, maintaining what the key values were for our company, seeing how we could use it as an advantage and keeping those investments in, peop in people um, well and truly grounded, I think. Mm. What do you think makes someone a great entrepreneur? Um, <clears throat> you have to be a risk taker. You have to be a bit crazy. <laughs> um, my wife tells me no more crazy ideas. So, uh, <laughs> do you say you married the wrong person? <laughs> uh, well, you know, everybody else in the company is younger than me, so you know they they can do the crazy ideas from this time yeah. onwards. But uh, um, I think you have to be passionate about ideas and passionate about trying to solve problems that we have in society. And um, I think that kind of passion really can drive you forward I think you have to be um, it's both a positive and a negative you almost have to live and breathe it 24 7 and that uh, at times can be a negative of course because you need balance in your life but it, it, it's not it's never a nine to five thing mm -hmm. um, and so my business partner and I are always thinking about how things can be better, always thinking about how we can either um, meet our clients' needs, improve the technology that we have, um, have our staff interact better with each other and with our customers, you know, all of these sorts of things. It's, it has to, you have to be passionate about it. Um, and, and I think you have to have an inquisitive mind. Um, I think if you lock your mind off, then 
it uh, you will never see the opportunities that are there. And so my uh, my studies, as in my career, have been very different. I have four qualifications from the four different universities in Queensland, and um, including USQ. And it's um, all of those studies are actually contributing to the kind of um, boss and the kind of entrepreneur that I am. But from my art studies, through my communication studies at UQ, through teaching studies at QT, through um, my IT studies at, at uh, USQ. So all of those contribute on a daily basis um, towards being a rounded kind of individual that can really uh, draw upon those experiences and skills and understandings to, to drive uh, the company and the technology and your ideas further, so. Hmm. My final question is, what advice would you give to someone who is just starting out, uh, but has inclinations to be innovative and entrepreneurial? Um, I think you, you do need to have a lot of self-belief and uh, that needs to be tempered with reality, of course, but, mm -hmm. um, but I think reality will temper that for you. Um, <laughs> Uh, additionally, when you're when you're young and you're first maybe graduated or you're just doing your course, uh, I think it's really worthwhile um, contacting uh, people who you feel are driving their companies in a particular way, um, just for a chat. Most people are fairly generous if they have the time. Um, or we have an ongoing program of taking on um, students from the universities to, to come and work on projects as part of their WIP or whatever the work placement program is for each of the universities. And um, it's particularly interesting for them because uh, theoretical studies around certain things are in a particular way and they have to be that way. Uh, but once you're out into a business and you start to see the many faceted sides of how your studies will actually be applied, Mm -hmm. from you know i've got to get this thing out the door because the customer's only paying this amount of money and you know i i would have spent six weeks doing that as a university thing but i've actually got 10 days to do it in uh and it has to meet these kind of standards because there's international regulations you know this kind of that kind of context can't be provided um outside of a work environment mm -hmm. so um i think one of the, one of the really good things the universities have done is the work placement programs uh because it does provide the ability for students to dip their toes in the water yeah. and, and get a sense of what's going on. Um, it also breaks some of their ideas. You know, a lot of, in IT especially, a lot of people uh, in the entrepreneurial space um, have high hopes of, you know, riding a wave of, of a, a unicorn kind of um, mm -hmm. company, which is great. And that happens, um, but it, it doesn't, it's a very different world in Australia to say uh, in the States. And it's a very different environment in Queensland to even the rest of Australia. So uh, you do need to pick up those skills where you can. Mm -hmm. So belief in yourself, expose yourself to a range of environments, um, try a lot of things. Um, when you're sitting in your seat at university, you will think you want to be this thing and have this job and follow this career. The best thing you can do is go and do six weeks at this, this employer over here, six weeks over there, six weeks over there, and you will very quickly find, oh, is that what it's really like? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to do that. Or actually, that's more interesting than what I thought it was going to be. Um, and that's a good investment in your future. And I would do that in the middle of your course rather than the end. Yeah, agreed. So, um, that's, so those two things I think are critical. Um, and surround your people with like, surround yourself with people who are like-minded. So, uh, if you have a group of people around you who provide you energy and you're all moving in the same kind of direction, um, then you've got much more chance of success. Mm -hmm. If you surround yourself with people who don't understand what you're doing, don't value what you're doing, um, don't care about what you're doing, then uh, you'll feel very lonely very quickly. So mm, That's great advice. Uh, and we should definitely talk, uh, the careers team should definitely talk to you about those placements, I think. Um, sure. But uh, yes, that is what the USQ Careers and Employability team help with. So students, please come and talk to us. Um, we would love to help you find those placements that help you with your career. So Philip Andrews, thank you so much for your time this afternoon. I really appreciate uh, learning more about your story. Uh, so thank you for sharing it. Uh, Cheers. And I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Philip. Bye. Bye.